We are going through 1 John, of course, and we're in chapter 2. As PJ just said last week was, was a lot of encouragement, what we call invitation. This week is challenge. And uh, Jesus, we see Jesus balancing invitation and challenge. As disciples, we've got to have invitation, grace, and we've got to have challenge, which, which some people call law. There's both. And so this is a little bit of a challenge here. So John says, hopefully it's up on the screen, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. So I'm going to expound on that. Kids, four to seven, y'all are going to head to the back now. Sounded so confident. Yes. I feel super confident. <laughs> Thank you. So, trying to, it looks like we've got a few kind of new people. I know we've got a few people in town for Thanksgiving. How many of you are going out of town for Thanksgiving? Are we the only people going out of town for Thanksgiving? Sarah's not sure. They haven't made plans yet. Saturday. Okay, after Thanksgiving. Everybody else is sticking around here? Yeah. We're going to your house. Well, y'all have fun hanging out in my front yard. Oh, um, we'll get in. <laughs> does, it, does it feel, it feels a little crazy to me that we're already at Thanksgiving week. It feels like just last month we were doing Fourth of July out at Glenlock Farms and giving out cotton candy and listening to the 80s cover band. How many of y'all were there? Was it Molly and the Ringwalds? Yeah. They weren't too bad. Um, but it's Thanksgiving week already. And I, I have kind of a problem with this week, with I, just the kind of what's happened with this week in recent history. I think there are plenty of us who are looking forward to Thanksgiving and looking forward to Thursday um, and celebrating gratitude. But I think there are a lot of people who are looking forward maybe even more to the next day, right? To, to Black Friday. And that bothers me. And for a long time, I don't remember when Black Friday kind of started being a thing, but for a long time, I mean, it was kind of like, it was kind of like this, like here's Thanksgiving and here's Black Friday and Black Friday had its own space and Thanksgiving was over here, but Black Friday was still kind of like, hey, poke, 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 poke. Hey, you know what? Tomorrow it's me and you're gone. Everybody's going to forget about you, right? It was, it was kind of like that. But now it's like, scoot over just a minute. Okay. <laughs> You cannot, this chair is not big enough for the both of us. I'm going to have my space and some of your space. Because now the sales start on Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving afternoon. And we can't set aside a full day to stop everything else and be grateful for what we have. Now, later that day, we're rushing out and going, you know what? I don't have enough stuff after all. And this mad frenzy and people are getting stampeded and it gets ugly. And that's a problem. That's a problem for us when, when materialism is starting to trump gratitude. Because gratitude is meant to be a big part of our lives every day, not just one day a week. It's great that we set aside a day to forget everything else and just focus on gratitude. But it's a problem when materialism is starting to, to take over that. And the, the holiday that celebrates materialism and consumption say holiday, is starting to get more space. And of course, if you include what happens Monday, yeah, I was expecting like all the, the tech geeks in the room to go. But, and then Amazon gives you what? Not just Cyber Monday, but Cyber Week, right? So now, you know, we're celebrating materialism for, I mean, I know that's not really it, but that's kind of, it drives us to go more stuff, more stuff, more stuff, and forget about all of our gratitude. And John has some warnings about that in this passage. And he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Um, now, just to be really clear, and hopefully this is obvious, um, are we supposed to love the world? This same John, who just wrote, do not love the world, also wrote John 3.16. Same author. And that's the most well-known verse in all of Scripture. Can we just recite 
the first line of that verse together. For God so loved the PJ's being like, he said earth. <laughs> Tree hugger. Um, for God so loved the world. And we're called to love the world too. It's, it's the, the first and second greatest commandments. Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then when somebody said, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. And one of the points of that par- parable is that your neighbor is the person that you feel strongly inclined to dislike. That's, that's your neighbor. Um, we are even called to love our enemies. So Jesus never said, only love the people who look like you and dress like you and vote like you and believe what you believe. Right? Love your enemies. So we're called to love the world. But the stuff of the world, the world's ways, that's what John is talking about here. And so he says, can we leave the verse up there? Because I'm going to be referring to it a lot. It says, do not love the world or the stuff in the world. Um, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, but everything in the world. And then he kind of unpacks what he means here. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Lust of the flesh, this is the stuff that our, that our body craves, that our senses crave. These are physical pleasures, and the world is full of them. Now, I'm sure you can think of some of those physical, physical pleasures that he's probably referring to without me having to spell them out. But there are some others that maybe are not so obvious. What about food? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Food. Drink. Those are physical pleasures. Um, I would include even things like art. Things that appeal to the sense of sight and seeing. Things that we drink in with our eyes. Um, how about music? How many of you are going to have music playing in the background on Thanksgiving? Yeah, I mean, we like music. PJ, the other gay keys don't have music playing. Except maybe KSBJ, really? That's pro- okay. Yeah, you do. Only when, there's, only when there are meetings at your house. Gotcha. Okay. But that's, um, that's something of the flesh. That's lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes, that's everything else. On the way here, we tried to take a picture of it. We didn't get one. We saw a Ford GT. How many of you know what that is? That's, that's a pretty cool car. Um, so lust of the eyes, these are the things that we look at and we go, I want that. That's the car. That's the house. That's the outside of the house, the landscaping. That's the interior decorating inside. That's the piece of property That's the technology, lust of the eyes. This is the stuff that we look at and that we want. Are these things wrong in and of themselves? They're not wrong in and of themselves. In fact, this week, we're going to sit down and we're going to thank God for the stuff that's in our lives, aren't we? We're going to sit there and we're going to be thankful for the clothes that we're wearing, for the people around the table, for, and we're going to celebrate it uh, with a, a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A physical pleasure, the physical pleasure of food and drink and maybe some music playing in the background. And we're going to be grateful for those things. Um, but you'll notice that John, at least in this translation, uses the word lust. That is when desire leaves its proper place and because, becomes something entirely different, becomes something based entirely in selfishness. And it leads to what he refers to as the pride of life. That's a tricky phrase to translate your different Bibles might say something different. Some, some say the pride of life. This one says um, the pride in one's possessions or the boasting of what ha- one has and does. Or I saw um, the pride in one's achievements and possessions. What it all comes down to is, is us trying to get the stuff of the world, not just the physical stuff, but also the world's ways, status and acclaim and all of that getting all of that stuff to define our significance and to satisfy us and to bring us the peace and joy that really only God can bring. Um, When we try to isolate God and go, you know what? I can define my life for myself and I can be satisfied in myself. I can provide everything I need for myself. That's the pride of life. Um, The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes lead to the pride of life. When these things lead, leave their context and our hearts are placed on those things rather than God. So that's a question that John is, is making us ask here. What is your heart set on? 
Is it set on God and his ways, or is it set on the world and its ways? Um, A good question for us to ask ourselves is, are we looking forward more to Friday than to Thursday? John wants us to wrestle with this because, and here's why, these two things, or here's one of the reasons why, these two things cannot go together. Love of God and love of the world, as John is talking about here, do not go hand in hand. And sometimes we try to squeeze them both into our hearts and our minds and our lives, and they don't go together. Jesus himself said, nobody can serve two masters, right? You're going to serve God, or you're going to love God and hate the other one, or you're going to love the other one and despise God. And specifically when Jesus said that, he was referring to money. Money as a symbol of um, everything that we can acquire on our own steam. Jesus said, you can't serve two masters, and we try to. Um, that's why John is saying here, if you love the world, the, if, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And I think we as Christians find lots of creative ways to try to squeeze those two things in. And we, we run after stuff and we go, God, I want you to get on board with my plan and I want you to bless my life with abundant material possessions. And we even work it into our theology. And there are people who will tell you that if you're really following God, then he's going to rain down all of these material blessings on you. Now he may, right? Um, but those things get out of whack when our hearts are given to those things instead of to God. And our heart can only be given to one or the other. Now, in your own personal context, one or the other of those may win out. Love for God may win out, or love for the world may win out. But one of them is going gonna, is gonna to push the other out. But in an eternal context, one of those things has already won. Right? That's why it says the world and its possessions or its lust are passing away. They, he says it with confidence. They are passing away. Not they may pass away, not it's a safer bet if you place your heart on God because God may win. We, the jury's still out on that. He says it with confidence. The world and its desires are passing away. Every time I speak, every time I study, I become aware of how the, the big picture of what God is doing is sort of seen in every little small snippet of the Bible. So the big picture is this. A long time ago, God made Adam and Eve and humanity and everything was perfect. And we were living in perfect relationship with God, which is how things were meant to be. God satisfying our every need. Um, and that's how things were. But then Satan shows up one day and he tells Adam and Eve, you, you know what? I know God told you not to eat of that fruit. And he said that you were going to die if you ate of that fruit. But here's what's actually going to happen. If you eat of that fruit, your eyes are going to be opened and you're going to have godlike wisdom and you're finally going to have the wisdom to govern your own affairs and you're going to be able to stand on your own two feet. You're going to be able to grow up and you don't have to be dependent on God anymore because Satan would say dependency on anything other than yourself is bad. God knows this. And he's trying to keep you down. He's trying to oppress you. He's trying to keep you from realizing your full potential. And he's threatened by what would happen if you were to eat that fruit. So he said, you need to rise up and seize your destiny and eat that fruit and become like God so that you don't need to eat him anymore. Don't need to rely on him anymore. And we fell for it. And that lie has infected us ever since. And that lie has broken us. It's caused us to turn away from God and turn to our own means and our own um, devices and we're broken and we cannot do anything perfectly. And the thing is, our hearts were made for things that are so much bigger than what this world can give us. Our spirits were made for infinite and eternity. Um, C.S. Lewis points out that we're far too easily satisfied. He says we're like, when when we reject the stuff that God has for us, We're like kids who are playing in a slum, playing in the mud, making mud pies and satisfied with that rather than accepting the offer of a a holiday down in the Caribbean or something. That's what C.S. Lewis says. And I think that's so fitting. We're far too easily satisfied when we we fall for um, living in the world's ways 
and trying to satisfy ourselves and find peace and hope and joy and fulfillment and meaning and status and all of these things. And it's a temptation for everybody, wherever you are, in the workplace, at school, in your neighborhood. Everything is shouting at you, don't look to God, look to your own means and your own devices, stand on your own two feet, let the world define who you are, because the world has got joy and peace for you. But John says, the world and its ways are passing away. So what he's saying is, if you're doing that, it's kind of like if I were to come to you and say, I've got a company that I started a few years back, and uh, we're, we're publicly traded now, and I wanted to give you the option of, of buying some stocks and investing in my company. You'd probably have a few questions, right, if I were to say that. What would one of your main questions be, do you think? What's my plan? Well, if you're going to invest in my company, you're going to want to know how profitable my company is. Luke's got a plan. What do you got, Luke? How, and how much money can they make, right? Because if you're going to give me money, you're going to want, to give, want me to give you back a lot more money eventually, right? If you're investing in my company. So being a savvy business person, I would have a, I'd have a chart all ready for you, and it would kind of look like this chart right here. And I'd go... Well, five years ago, when I started, back in 2014, we were up there at half a million. But the next year, we lost a little bit. And the year after that, we lost quite a bit more. We were down at 200K. And then 2017, we are at 100K. And actually, this year, we're in the red, and we're not making any money at all. Um, but then you might go, well, OK, do you have a plan, like some of you are saying? Are you changing things? Is there new ownership, new management? Are you going to do something differently? And I'd go, no, we're not, same owner. We're just doing what we know how to do because we feel like we're pretty good at it. Uh, that's just, that's what we know how to do. So we're just going to keep doing it. You would be a fool to invest in this company, wouldn't you? Would anybody in here invest in this company? John is saying, when you invest your life in the stuff of this world, that's what you're doing. And it's a waste. John is saying the stuff of this world is passing away. It's going to pass away. And you will not get a good return on your investment. It's going to drag you down with it. And we are made for bigger things. So he says, the world and its desires are passing away, but the one who does the will of the Father remains forever. Can you put that up there, Levi? It's the second page. <laughs> The one who does the will of God remains forever. Does that raise questions for you? John's not throwing grace away. John isn't going, oh, you know what? Never mind about all the grace. You actually have to earn your way to God. He's not forgetting theology here. PJ preached just a few weeks ago a passage in which John said, this is how we know if we have come to know the Father, if we do his will, if we do what the Father asks us. Jesus says, um, if you love me, how many of you know the verse? If you love me, you will what? I will. Yes, Luke. Man, Luke, I should just give the microphone to Luke. Thank you, Luke. Yes, if you love me, you will do what I command. Doing the will of God is evidence of love for God. It's evidence of salvation. It does not earn salvation. And so I just want to make sure that nobody, and this is why context is important when we're reading the Bible. If we take this verse all by itself, we might go, oh my gosh, I've got to earn my way to God. And I feel like such a failure because I mess up all the time. You're going to mess up. It was grace that saved you. And it's grace that's going to sustain you. Because you're going to mess up every day, sometimes knowingly. You're going to know, I shouldn't do this. I'm going to do it anyway. And then there are going to be other times when you're going to go, oh, I didn't even realize that I messed up. But I just messed up. Grace is there for you. So John is not throwing all of that away. But what he's saying is, if you love the Father, if your heart is anchored to him rather than the stuff of the world, and the evidence of that is that you're pursuing his will, imperfectly, but pursuing his will, then you are going to live forever with him. Then God has filled you with his eternal life. He's saying, don't invest in the stuff of this world. It's a waste. If your heart is invested with God, though, then you will remain 
forever. And you will find eternal value. You will find eternal worth. You will find eternal joy in him. There are some people in our church, and maybe in this room, I don't know, who are looking forward to this week. As they look forward to this week, they're going, you know what? I don't feel any temptation by Black Friday right now because my life is a mess. And I'm frankly having a hard time trying to see stuff to be grateful for. I'm not feeling the temptation to um, attach my heart to worthly, to earthly things because their lives are a mess right now and there's other stuff going on and that's what's got all their attention. And they're going, I, you know what I want to be thankful for? I just want some peace in my life. One of the best ways that we can express gratitude and that we can actively sever our tie and our attachment to earthly things is to be generous, just as Crystalline was praying. Um, if you are, if you know somebody who's going through a difficult time, one of the best ways that you can take action on do not be attached to the stuff of this world is to be willing to leave your comfortable situation and to go and enter into their suffering and just be with them. That is, by the way, what Jesus did, Right? You know, he was in heaven, he was in perfection, no pain, no suffering, and he entered into our suffering in a way that we will never be able to enter into the suffering of another person. He took it on himself, right? He experienced pain and rejection and loss and sorrow. Um, and not only that, he experienced the, the punishment that we earned. He didn't deserve any of the pain because our brokenness caused that, but he entered into it. And you can be a picture of that if you are willing to detach yourself from the physical comforts of this life for a while. Just go and sit with somebody. Even if you don't have the words to say, just being with them can make a big difference. And Paul talks about being grateful always. Lots of the authors of the Bible talk about gratitude, not for every situation, but in every situation. And that's a tough thing. It's easy to kind of go, yeah, I get that when our lives are going well. But when your life's falling apart, then it's kind of hard to get that. Wait, I'm supposed to be grateful in this situation? Here's the thing. The world and its stuff is passing away. That includes not just the stuff that we want to get attached to. That includes the suffering that we want to get rid of. That stuff is also passing away. And so that's why we can have hope. And that's why we can be grateful. Because we know that in painful circumstances, those painful circumstances don't have the final say. But sometimes we need to be reminded of that. So, this week, let's be grateful people. As you sit down at your Thanksgiving table, um, be thankful for the clothes that you're wearing. Look around at the table and be thankful for the people there. Um, as you're in a house, be thankful that you have a house that you can live in. Be thankful for the bed that you slept in that night. Be thankful for the car that got you there. As you're looking around, be thankful that you have the, the ability to see. As you're listening to the voices of those around you or the music, be thankful that you can hear. Um, we have a lot to be thankful for. But don't let your gratitude just stop with those things. Uh, Jesus, there, there was a story where Jesus heal, healed these 10 lepers. And they all ran away feeling really, really happy and thankful that they were healed, that their bodies were cleaned. But one of them went you know what? My gratitude doesn't, isn't just in being healed. My gratitude has an object and that object is Jesus. And so he ran back to thank Jesus. That's what we have. Don't be grateful just for the stuff that's passing away. Be grateful that we've got hope, that you've got Jesus, that he is with you. And then maybe go and remind somebody else that he's with them too, if they're having a hard time seeing it. So let's be grateful people this week. And, um, and let's be generous people as well. And don't get attached to this stuff. If you go out on Good Friday to take advantage of the sales, great. Don't fall for the trap that that stuff is going to make you happy. Don't fall for the, for the trap that that stuff is going to fulfill you. Let's let our hearts be anchored in God who will last forever.